Jesus Christ, your fellow believers and followers of him. Quick question for you. When you address Pastor Pufal as pastor, what picture comes to mind? The word pastor really means shepherd. And so Pastor Pufal is the shepherd that God has placed to shepherd the flock that is here at Christ Lutheran. Years ago, people might also address their pastor as minister. So when you think of minister, Pufal, what picture comes to mind? The word minister really means servant. Service is ministry. So when we think of Pastor Pufal as servant, he's first of all serving God by sharing God's word with people, and then he's serving you by sharing that life-giving, life-strengthening word of God for your benefit. It's interesting as we you know, go through the catechism, how, how, how we see this, this attitude of God as a servant. For example, after the six days of creation, uh, after everything has been made on the sixth day, then God also, the last thing he makes is man. And then he gives man, he serves man with this beautiful and wonderful creation that we so much enjoy to this day. Second article reminds us that Jesus Christ served us by coming into this earth as the God-man and, and that he lived a perfect life which we can't live and yet he died on the cross taking God's punishment for all of our sins. And then the Holy Spirit serves us by coming into our hearts through that word and he creates faith and strengthens that faith through the word. The whole idea of God, one of the most wonderful attributes of the Lord is just this servant character of our Lord. And tonight as we look at these readings, we're going to look at that aspect of, of our Lord who serves us with his word. We might call it the ministry or the service of the word. And, and as we do that, we think of that parable about the sower and the seed. And let's put it into modern day terminology. So when a farmer goes out to, to, to plant crops in the spring, he plows up the field. And then what does he do? He doesn't just put one or two seeds in the middle of that acre. If you've ever seen a farmer planting, he, he has his tractor and he's pulling this planter be, behind him. I, I talked to my brother-in-law today who's a farmer up in Black Creek and, and uh, the planter he uses has these six bins or boxes behind him. He's pulling those and each of those is filled with seed and, and he goes out and he plants all kinds of seed. In fact, he told me today that, that uh, one acre, if he's planting corn, there'll be 32,000 seeds that'll plant to one acre. Now multiply that by a couple hundred acres, and that's a lot of seed, isn't it? Well, that's the way the Lord works. He's abundant in planting his seed in this world. Uh, he plants thousands of seeds. Uh, we see that in the parable of the, the sower, and the seed. We, we think of how in Corinth, Paul went to Corinth. He was at first by himself, but then he met Achilla and Priscilla, and they became co-partners in his ministry there. And then Silas and Timothy arrive, and pretty soon there's all kinds of people in Corinth sharing the word of God. And think of how God abundantly serves you and me with his word. How he serves our little synod with all the pastors and teachers and, and Christian lay people like yourself, you moms and dads who share the word with other people around you. Think of how he's blessed you right here in this congregation. I don't know if you have some place where you have a picture of your pastors, your former pastors up on a wall somewhere. Many congregations have that, but... Isn't it neat that God didn't put just one pastor here when this congregation was founded who died, you know, 120 years ago? 
No, he keeps giving you pastor after pastor. He gives you teachers and more teachers for your school. He continues to give you moms and dads who share the word with their young. That's the ministry of God's word, how God works through all kinds of, of means to get his word into the hearts and souls of his people here and around the world. And that's what we're reminded of in that passage from Isaiah. God says through Isaiah, just as the rain and the snow come down from the sky and do not return there unless they first water the earth and make it give birth and cause it to sprout so that it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In the same way, my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty. Rather, it will accomplish whatever I please and it will succeed in the purpose for which I sent it. When God sends rain from heaven, it's not just one or two drops, is it? <laughs> There's billions of droplets of water that come down during a rainstorm. When it's winter and the snow begins to fall, he just doesn't send one or two flakes to swirl around in the snow to entertain, or in the sky to entertain us. No, there's billions of those white flakes that come down from heaven. That's a sign of God's abundant mercy and grace because he didn't have to do that. We didn't ask for him to serve us. He does that on his own because of his grace and mercy. We don't even deserve it, and yes, he continues to pour out that ministry of the word on you and me. And another example would be just think of all those people over the centuries who have translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into the language of people like you and me so that in English we can understand what God's saying. And it's in hundreds and hundreds of languages, different languages throughout the, the world. And it's just another example of the abundance of ways in which God gives us his word, that ministry, that service of the word, so that he serves us with that life-giving and life-sustaining word of God. Now, of course, not everybody appreciates that, do they? In the sower of the seed, there were some whose hearts were so hardened, the word of God didn't even find a root, a place to root itself. In their hardened hearts, they didn't want to listen to the word or believe it. And Satan stole that seed from them. The, there were others in which the seed fell on shallow ground. It, it seemed like they were going to be okay, but when persecution came along because people were making fun of them or hurting them because of their adherence to the word and to Christ, they, they said, I don't want that. And they quit reading their Bibles and left the church and that seed, that plant, died. There were other seeds that fell, what appeared to be on, on good ground. It wasn't so good, but it, it seemed to be growing well. But then all the cares and the crises of this world made them so, so anxious that they, they couldn't understand why Jesus was allowing these things. They, they were concerned about having more wealth and fame and basically those cares, that wealth, all those things came together and it choked that plant and it died. We think of what happened at Corinth, right? Paul was there. Others came, and they were preaching the word, but the Jews in the synagogue would have nothing to do with it. They slandered them, began to persecute them. Basically, Paul said, that's enough. I'm leaving. And that happens today, too, doesn't it? Our church, your church, you share the word. You do that on your own with your children, with others in the world around you, your friends and neighbors and relatives, and some people just don't appreciate it. Some may, may look like they're really interested, but then persecution or other things get in the way, and that seed dies. And yet you and I still have that wonderful, joyful promise that God has given us in his word, that that seed in its own way, is going to produce fruit. We think of how in that parable of the, of the sower and the seed, that some of that seed 
produce 100 or, or 60 times or 30 times more than what was sown. We see it in, in that reading where Paul goes to Corinth. Uh, the, the Jews didn't want him in the synagogue, so where'd he go? He went right next door to the house of Titius uh, Justice. And he began to preach there. And he, he ended up staying in Corinth for a year and a half, preaching and teaching the word of God and, and founding a congregation that built on that word of God that was preached to them. So God's promise still stands. His word, as we heard before, will accomplish whatever I please, he said, and it will succeed in the purpose for which I sent it. And your proof. God planted the seed of his word in your heart. You have come to faith. You believe in Jesus, and that's why you're here tonight. In the heart of the unbelievers, in the sense that when judgment day comes and everybody stands before God, those who don't believe, the Bible says, will be without excuse. God might say to them, you know, Mary, from Christ Church in Big Ben, she went over to you and, and, and she spoke God's word when you were troubled and she told you about Jesus and to trust in him, but you didn't believe her. You didn't trust God. Or maybe Kevin from church will go to his uncle and say, uncle, you can't keep committing that sin. That, that's wrong. God doesn't want that. You need to repent and trust Jesus. And he turns away and God will say, I, I gave you that chance. Kevin went to your house. Yeah, yeah, people will be without excuse on that last day because they didn't believe or trust in God and his word. But the question, the ultimate question now is this. Why does God give that ministry of the word to you and me and it's not just to save us think about that he doesn't give it just to, to save us I mean that's one of the big purposes he gives it to us is so that we might know who Jesus is and might have everlasting life with him but why listen to these words of our text once again my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty. Rather, it will accomplish whatever I please and it will succeed in the purpose for which I sent it. Yes, you will go out with joy and in peace you will be carried along. God gives us this word in abundance so that we have joy and so that we can be carried along in peace. Because you see, you look at the world around you right now and there's a lot of disgusting things going on. We get disillusioned. We're disappointed. We get depressed by the things that are happening in our world. How will the kids go to school this year? What's going to happen? Will they ever find a cure for COVID-19? What's going on with all this looting and protesting and killing and murder in the, in the cities? And, and what about those things that I've done? The shameful things that I have done in my life, which means that I just deserve only God's wrath and anger and don't deserve this amazing love he's given us. Well, What's going to go on? What's going to happen? I have all these cares, these worries and concerns. I'm fearful. I'm frightened. I don't know what to do. We live in a world that makes us feel depressed and disappointed and disillusioned. And when the Lord spoke these words through Isaiah, they felt that same disappointment and, dis and disillusion and that same depression. You see, God spoke these words through Isaiah at a time when the northern kingdom, the ten northern drives, had already been taken away, captured by the Assyrians. Now the Assyrians had come south. They had already taken a bunch of the, the lands and cities of Judah. Now they've surrounded Jerusalem. It looks like they're going to all die 
or be taken away captive. Now God gives them a miraculous miracle at the time of Hezekiah and and 180,000 Assyrians die in one night and the Assyrians go back home uh, with their tail between their legs. Whoops. But what happens? Well, those people know that yeah, their, their society is spiritually and morally bankrupt and, they, and Isaiah's prophesied that the Babylonians are going to come and take them away because of their sin too. But there's believers there. And these believers are disillusioned, they're depressed, they're disappointed too. And that's where God gives them his word. He says, I'm going to give you my word in abundance. I'm going to bring my word like the rain and snow that comes down from the sky so that you can have joy, so that you can go out with joy and so that you can be carried along with peace. As you read through the book of Isaiah, you find these wonderful passages which give joy and peace to the believer's hearts then and to you and me today. Think of this one that you probably memorized years ago when it talks about a virgin that will conceive and give birth to a son and name him Emmanuel. God, Emmanuel, God with us, God coming to be with us to take away our sin. To live that perfect life we couldn't. Or, or as Isaiah also says, he was crushed for our guilt that our sins deserve. The, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. No matter how bad this world gets, you know that you're loved. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know that you are never alone. Isaiah gives us this passage. He says, through, God says to him, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be overwhelmed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. No matter how bad things get, no matter how depressing and disillusioned you might be, you know that you have God walking with you. You're, you're like a little child, and God is holding your right hand. You're in his right hand, and he's walking you through all the difficulties and trials and struggles of this life, even through the valley of the shadow of death. He'll be with you. You are not alone. He will strengthen you for whatever comes your way. And you know that you have a future. You're on this side of heaven, and this side of heaven sometimes just stinks, and it smells, it's ugly, but God says this, also from the book of Isaiah. I'm about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered. They will not come to mind. Rejoice and celebrate forever because of what I am creating. I will rejoice over my people. The sound of weeping will not be heard in her again, nor will the sound of crying. You're on this side of heaven now. But that's not the end of life. There's heaven itself. And it's more wonderful and awesome. It's a new heaven and a new earth without sin. And you'll have joy and peace that will never end. And it's all yours because of what this Savior has done for you. So when you leave church tonight, when you go home, Rejoice. As the Lord said, go out in joy. God loves you. He loves you so much he sent his son and that son died and the Holy Spirit put faith in your hearts. You have things to be excited about and joyous about and you can let peace carry you through the trials and troubles of this world because you know where you're headed to an everlasting peace in heaven. And when you come to partake of Christ's body and blood tonight, that's what he's saying to you, isn't he? Take, eat, this is my body and blood given and shed for you. Your sins are forgiven and you can have peace. Because you know, this is not the last chapter in your life. There's one big one left, an everlasting one in heaven with him. So dear friends, go in peace. Go in joy and let peace carry you along. Amen.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. It is my prayer that God has richly blessed you through this online worship opportunity. If you are new to our ministries, we would love to connect with you so that we can connect you to Christ. Please contact us at our website at ChristBigBen.com. May God richly bless your week.